start. All right, well, welcome everybody. I'm still admitting a few more people, but let me just set the stage for what we wanna talk about today. So I know a couple of you were able to make yesterday's call where we were, we, it was a brainstorming discussion around how to build a business case and for your customer marketing programs, either to get more resources, to purchase technology, to, or even just to better showcase the value that you're delivering to your organization so, so you get more appreciation. And that discussion was really fascinating because it also branched into how do you, uh, by part of the challenge is also going in and figuring out how to get the cooperation and participation of the other functional areas of your company that you need in order to make your program successful. So it's a very robust discussion. But then uh, as we were preparing for that session and I was doing some research, trying to figure out, uh, understand from, from some experts in the space, what, what challenges and, and how they go about getting executive level approval and uh, buy-in for their and, and budget for their programs. One of the people I reached out to was Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, you want to just wave? I'll let you introduce yourself, do a proper introduction. But I've known Elizabeth for a long time. She's um, an expert in this space. She's been a practitioner. She's been a consultant. She's a consultant. She's an advisor, uh, writer, uh, all things customer marketing and customer advocacy. But when I was talking to Elizabeth, one of the things that she brought to the table with me was this whole idea of really under, identifying who your customer marketing stakeholders are, or you could even call them your customer-led growth stakeholders. So if you've embraced this idea of customer-led growth and you want to drive it across your organization, who, who are those stakeholders that you need to really understand what are their goals, what are their needs, and how can your program and how can customers help them achieve their goals? And and he actually has a methodology around that, which I was fascinated by about about how to get that stakeholder approval. So I th I just thought it made total sense to combine that with the session we did yesterday because it's a great way to dive into a specific area around um, you know, building your business case is really around understanding the needs and goals and of your stakeholders so you can make sure that you're meeting them. Okay, so. So with that, why don't I, I'll be, I'll, I'll turn it over to Elizabeth in just a second. We'll, we'll, we're just going to share some slides and talk about how she does and gains the state stakeholder approval. Very fascinating stuff. Uh, I'll be asking her some questions throughout. If anybody does have a question as she's going through and it'll pertain to what she's talking about in the moment, please ask your question. There's, we're a small enough crowd. You could come off mute if you want to voice your question or you can put it into the chat, but we also have plenty of time after she shares some of her slides to uh, for, for discussion afterwards. So we want to make this highly interactive as usual for our expert exchanges. So Elizabeth, welcome. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was fantastic background. And um, I'd like to build off what Jeff said about um, the, the conversation yesterday, which I listened to, which was, was fascinating. I think it's really relevant right now because um, a lot of people at, at this point are, are really kind of uh, facing challenges around layoffs, around reorganizations, around um, uh, resources being clawed back in many cases. And um, th this space has come so far, customer marketing has come so far in the past 10 years or so. Um, I think a lot of people are quite anxious about saying, we don't want to take a step backwards now. We don't want to be seen as something that's a nice to have and not essential. And um, in chatting with Jeff and with Kaylee, you know, over the past couple of months around some of these issues, what's come up is that, um, I think that the key uh, to being seen as essential is making sure that we've identified all of the parts of the organization that are already participating in customer marketing, customer-led growth, and maybe haven't been recognized as such in order to bolster our business case. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and talk through some of these slides. And uh, go ahead and let me know when we can see this, Jeff. Looks good. Okay, great. So um, we've taken the rather ambitious title that customer growth will save your job. Customer, I'm sorry, customer led growth will save your job. Um, and I don't think that's really too ambitious um, if we take a step back for a minute because um, it hits on um, 
what's most important to the enterprise today and even to smaller companies, which is continuing growth in an economic downturn or economic headwinds, as we like to uh, hear from so many people today. So what I'd like to do is see if we can shift our mind uh, set just a little bit from surviving these, this period to thriving in it. Um, and I'm biased. I think that customer-led growth will help us uh, identify a lot of uncovered or unidentified opportunities. That's because we're the red thread that ties everything together. If we look at customer marketing, um, we have our fingers in a lot of pots around the company. Um, customer experience, revenue, the channel, product, that's just for a start. Everybody needs something from a customer or is giving something to a customer. We have a lot of different programs going on in different places. And there's a lot of ha uh, things happening with customers that may not be apparent to people um, every day. They're happening in silos. They're happening in, in kind of uh, quiet little programs. Um, they're happening directly between stakeholders and in the C-suite and customers, and they aren't not getting captured anywhere. And so I see customer marketing um, as stepping forward um, and, and kind of waving the flag for customer-led growth, seeing that we are the red th thread um, and that we have a lot to add, that the part, is the sorry, the sum is greater than the 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 sum is greater than the whole of its parts, is what I was trying to say there. So if we can put that all together, we can say that we can stop playing defense, start to become indefensible, indispensable. How do we do that? My methodology is really not rocket science. Um, it breaks it down into three steps. We need to analyze everything that's going on inside the enterprise. How are customers being impacted by people and how are they making an impact back on us? What kind of bi-directional value is being generated? We need to democratize. We need to figure out who's being left out of this virtuous circle, what opportunities are being missed inside our companies and what opportunities are we failing to offer our customers? And we need to socialize. We need to make sure that everything that's happening is being captured, it's being um, measured, it's being, uh, it's being leveraged and that we're communicating all of this back up into the C-suite. So um, my recommendation is always to start from our strengths, is to stop saying, you know, what are we doing just in our own little silo to figure out what's working inside your company, whether it's happening inside customer marketing or it's happening somebody somewhere else. I think we should stop worrying about convincing people that what we're offering uh, has great value and start showing them. We know that this is true. So let's start drawing attention to the synergies that are happening. We can, we can influence customer-led growth when we start to tie this all together. We connect the dots. We can um, build a seven-step customer uh, marketing charter like Kevin showed us uh, last week. We can put together um, you know, all the things that we talked about yesterday uh, on Jeff's call, but we can't wait for buy-in to get started with this stuff. If we're gonna want the executive uh, team at our company to start supporting this, we need to make a start on our own. We need to bring them something and show them something that's already happening, that's already working. Um, and I'm not saying to, to ask for forgiveness other than permission. What I'm saying is to capture what's already happening in the company that's working well and build from there. Let me just uh, ask there, because that's mm -hmm. such an important point. I mean, you're really saying we have to be proactive. And, and one of the things that came up yesterday was a lot of times, uh, like the C-level executives in a company may not even totally understand or recognize the potential that customers and your customer programs could have. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that's another reason why you can't just wait for them to come to you saying, hey, do this program for us. No. Right. I mean, I mean, no. we, 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 right. So I think that's what you're saying as well, as well right, uh, about you know, not waiting for buy in. But, but exactly. Leading the exactly. Yeah. Yeah, not just not waiting for buying, you know, in the sense of, you know, let's start this program, start this program for me, but also not worrying about where great customer led growth activities are happening in your company. Doesn't matter if they're happening in your department, doesn't matter if they're happening in, in product, it can be anywhere. Start identifying them and start to figure out what are the synergies, because no man is an island. You know, we know that our teams are tiny. Um, we can't do all this alone. So we need to figure out figure out who else is doing great stuff and, and start to work with them. So um, my methodology that, that Jeff kind of alluded to is really very simple. It's about stakeholder interviewing. I think that if we can start with stakeholder interviewing, we set ourselves up for great success. 
Um, and I think we really need to swing high on these things. We need to figure out who in our company are our obvious stakeholders. You know, we, we know, you know, sales is an obvious stakeholder. We know that uh, whoever's running your community, if it's not us, is, is an obvious stakeholder. But there's a lot of other people that we may not think about, um, either because we don't interact with them regularly, they don't ask us for things, or perhaps there are a couple of levels above or below you in the organization, you haven't thought about that. Um, so you really need to start, sit down and kind of put together a little organizational chart for people who are interacting with and, um, and impacting customers, being impacted by customers. Figure out how far up the chain you can go and figure out how you can get introduced to these people if you don't already know them. You know, if your company has a culture where you can just reach out to anybody, that's great. But if not, you know, look around the company for someone that you have a great relationship with, who's been there for a long time, um, you know, who, who came into the company at the same time as this other person, whatever you can use to get an introduction. Um, because what you want to be doing that you'll see in the next stage is sitting down with them and asking them um, a series of, of rather methodological questions. So let's, let's actually take these. The first step I would say is set the stage. Figure out from a mind map, who are your hidden customer-led growth stakeholders? You know, it might be a Salesforce admin. You know, I think those are one of the, one of the most important people that you can work with in the company. Um, if you can't get your metrics out, um, you have no idea what your levers are and, you know, how well anything is performing. Identify your allies. allies I'm sorry. Um, overcoming skepticism and showing people how if they, if you let them help you, um, you can help them and vice versa. So a lot of times you'll make get people say, oh, this is just another person that's calling me up, asking me for something inside the company. They just want nominations. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that if you can get a meeting with the person who's the head of your industry solutions team, for example, and you can sit down and say, what do you need from customers that you're not getting? What kind of wonderful interactions do you have with customers that aren't getting captured? What are some of the things that are happening in a silo? You know, what, do you, what kinds of content do you need that, you know, has customer content that you're not getting? Are we meeting people at every stage of their buyer's journey? You know, what's going on? And start to get them to talk about the frustrations that they may have, fantastic stuff they're doing that you may not know about. Um, don't come and say, you know, what can we do to get more nominations? What can we do to get more people to participate in our community? That won't be a really productive discussion at a high level. What you can start to do is really unpick the various ways that they have need of customers or are impacting customers and start to collect all this um, in, in a really um, diligent way so that we can kind of score it and look at it and create some small amount of metrics for your company uh, at a later stage which kind of something that I already touched on, have confidence. Um, you know, you're the pro at customer marketing in your company. You have to have the point of view that the exec team wants to hear from you. you they want to know what you bring to the table and they want to feed back to you what's going on with them. You know, I find reaching out to, for instance, thought leaders. If you have thought leaders in, in a business unit or in a, in a product team or in, in, a, in a solutions or industry area, these people are interacting with customers all the times in ways that you may not even know about. You know, they're going out to dinner together when they're traveling. They are, um, you know, they're calling each other to talk about different analyst calls. So being able to connect with the people that are having the kind of interactions that you may not get to see on a day-to-day -day ba basis is valuable for them and it's valuable for you. And the last part that I alluded to a few minutes ago about being methodological, um, I think it's really important. Um, I think that you need to be able to understand what all of the KPIs and all the metrics are in your marketing organization, in your sales organization, um, and really make friends with your Salesforce admin if you haven't already. You know, if you have a customer marketing platform, you're probably already working together, but if you don't have one, um, you know, you may not know all of the, the goodness that people can help you to uncover from, from your CRM. This is really important when we start talking about the metrics um, that are so important to everybody today about retention, about growth, um, about churn, about all of these kinds of things that are fundamental to building a customer marketing charter and to incentivizing customer-led growth. And, and so yeah. Elizabeth, I just, just wanted to, you know, call out here because uh, I think a common thread across all four of your, 
your boxes here really is to speak their language, right? Because that was another point that came up yesterday and that comes mm -hmm. up in a lot of my conversations is how hard it is sometimes for us to, to speak the language of that stakeholder, right? Mm -hmm. Because they, they have their own goals, their needs, their own measures. And uh, it, I, it, I, unless you're going to, is there any advice you have on how to develop that capability to do that? Uh, or do you, uh, or if that isn't coming up? I actually have a so. whole slide about that. Oh, okay, too. all right. I'm, I'm all glad right, that mind. you brought that up, which is great. I'll wait. But I, I think it's really important that you underline that because obviously, you know, we are not, you know, finance people. We, you know, are, are not, um, you know, engineers. But we need to know enough about what's going on in those functions to be able to have high level conversations with the people in those areas to make them understand that you're coming to them as a colleague, as an ally, as a peer, and not somebody that wants to learn from them or shadow, shadow them or, or create more work for them in some way. And right. there's a lot of ways that we can go about that. You know, um, I'm surprised at how many people don't read their company's quarterly and annual reports, for instance. I think that's a really great place to start. Um, you should be reading what the analysts have to say about your company all the time. You should cultivate relationships and friendships, you know, in each of these areas, even if you're not directly working with people. You can do things like if your company has a content board, can you ask to sit in on that? Can you, can you, you know, listen to what the, the, the people who use and produce content in your company from all over the company are talking about on a monthly basis? Um, you know, can you offer to help out at um, an executive briefing center if your company has one? You know, sometimes just, you know, being there on a day, even if you're not involved in that program, you can learn so much about the kinds of things that are important to people. Um, and again, you know, I think when we're talking about uh, metrics, um, you know, people are, are, they have their goals, you know, they have their numbers that they need to meet in every area of the company. If you're familiar with what those are, what's influencing them, what's driving them. You know, if, if you understand why conversion rate is important to your campaigns team, and if you understand, you know, um, what's happening with MDF and your channels team, um, you're gonna get a lot more out of the relationships that you're trying to develop. Nice. I hope that um, yes. Yes. Yeah, helps a little bit, Jeff. So, um, I, I alluded earlier to this idea of different personas, different people that impact customer-led growth. Um, and this idea of hidden stakeholders. You know, I think that if we're talking about kind of the main areas in marketing and sales and CX, in, in product and C-suite, these are kind of the big ones. Um, we all know that we have some responsibilities to those areas. We have kind of main stakeholders in those areas, but sometimes we haven't really taken the time to think about all of the different ways that customers are impacting those functions and how um, if we capture them all together um, and put them into some kind of you know, organized synergy um, that they really influence customer led growth. And what I thought was really interesting in chatting with Jeff when he, he pulled out the personas from last year's um, customer impact awards, customer X impact awards. And these are the categories. These personas were the categories for the awards, the ones that you see in in, um, in colors underneath here, the acquisition A, suspension engineer. And the ones above in black uh, were ones that um, my, my partner in crime, uh, Scott, Scott Stransky from Full Funnel Content and I have been thinking about uh, lately and how closely they overlapped with each other. And I suppose that shouldn't have been any kind of a surprise but it was validating for me to be able to see that in thinking about this, these are the main stakeholder areas um, inside most companies. Um, and obviously with these you know, lists of different functions underneath, we could go on for, for ages. But these are the big ones that I see repeated kind of over and over again. Um, and if we start to think about, you know, maybe in your company, uh, let's say um, uh, channel marketing doesn't sit in, you know, under or channel doesn't sit under marketing, but sits in an ANC organization. Or perhaps over here, you know, perhaps community doesn't sit in CX, but it sits in marketing. Those are kind of individual things to each company that you would fine tune as you went through this process. But the exercise that I kind of encourage is to sit down and figure out who are the personas inside your own company. This can help you figure out who you want to reach out to for stakeholder interviews and will help you kind of figure out how to go up the chain. So if you know kind of who's responsible for beta, you know, uh, maybe it doesn't sit in, in product, maybe it sits in IT. 
I usually see it sitting in, beta, in, in product. And if you figure out who that kind of rolls up to inside the organization, that's a great conversation that you can have. Um, the same thing for you know, a, a center of excellence is another one that I see overlooked often. It, it sometimes happen in, it happens in product or industry, and it's something that might not be on the radar of somebody working in customer marketing. But these are absolutely fantastic places to capture customer use cases, kind of real, real world customers who are doing fantastic work that often aren't getting highlighted um, in a public way in kind of success stories because what they're doing is being used internally to influence roadmap um, and, you know, and, and on reference calls or something like that. So um, this might be a good place to stop and see if anybody has any kind of insights or questions about some of these. No? Okay, we can move on. I thought it might be interesting to kind of call out one of them, the marketing mentor one, and show you kind of how we do a deep dive. So what I've done here, um, these are dense and I'm not gonna read through them. I don't think it's really important um, for the exercise at hand to, to, to go into uh, depth on them right now. But this Venn diagram is kind of two from the Customer X Impact Awards and one from the methodology that Scott and I are working on kind of come together to show us, I mean, we'll look at all these together, it starts to give us a really good idea of what the persona could look like in any given company. Um, you start to be able to pull out, you know, what are the most important attributes here? You know, if we're looking at, you know, customer acquisition, is that something that's really happening in marketing in your company? Um, is, it, is ABM something that's happening? What are they? And as you start to develop these for yourself, you'll have a much better idea of who you want to reach out to um, in your company. Going back to the idea of these interviews, I think we also need to approach them with a fair degree of humility. Um, you know, sometimes inside a company, we'll, we'll do listening campaigns, there's 360 degree feedbacks, there's surveys, there's QBRs, there's a lot of stuff that happens at a formal level. We use platforms and tools. But in my experience, for this to really work, um, you need to have a really good list. You need to leverage your relationships to get on people's calendars, and you need to sit down and just talk to them. Um, with a, you know, with an organized interview guide, I think it's really important. But I think really what you need to do is not be afraid to ask the hard questions. And I think a classic hard question is: if you're responsible for for producing case studies, for instance, if that's a big um, uh, thing that you have, we often get caught up in kind of getting the names producing the stories, meeting our numbers about these, getting them approved, getting them out the door. Sometimes we don't go back and ask the people who are, who are using these inside the organization, typically in, you know, in, your, I mean, your demand gen or in your, in your sales organization, if these case studies are really working for them. Are they getting the job done? Are they resonating? Are they boring? Are people reacting well to them? Um, and, you know, that's kind of stuff we can see numbers on our site, you know, who's clicking on them, who's downloading them. But we might not be hearing something, um, for instance, from our, our marketing campaigns team that says, you know what, we're not including these in our campaigns because they're not hitting the mark. Or, you know, you might hear something um, that says they're too long or the format that you're giving us, you know, isn't compelling. Um, and so if you're if you're humble enough to be able to go out to the people um, who are consuming what you're producing or perhaps are not getting what they need from you, you know, frequently we find that um, the, the things that we think are important in our customer program that we've put as our priorities that we're being measured on are not what people really need from us. And so they're going off and doing their own thing. They may not even be asking you for what they need from you. You know, maybe they need a quote library and that's 10th on your list of things to get out, you know, next half. Maybe they really need that right now. You know, maybe PR needs that yesterday. So if, if they're not getting that from you, maybe they're calling up customers on their own to get quotes. And maybe that's why you're running into some customer exhaustion when you're calling them and needing for something else because you don't even know that PR is calling them all the time to get some quotes. So I think it's it's a question of really just kind of not being afraid to ask the hard questions because we can really pivot it and help, you know, use it to help us get better. So kind of the four steps, 
they're really kind of basic for people who are used to doing interviews. We need to get on schedules. We need to create an interview guide and we need to do it just as if we were interviewing a customer. We need to really um, create the questions that, that leave room for people to give honest feedback, to talk about the challenges in their job, to talk about you know, how they interact with customers, uh, what aspects of their job directly impact customers. Um, and, and go through this, we want to try to get at metrics if we can. And I would really strongly suggest asking uh, your questions in a way that will allow them to be scored afterwards. So if you do a framework that says, you know, every time somebody, um, you know, mentions a customer, uh, customer case study, you know, ask them, you know, how useful is that for you, you know, on a scale of one to 10. Capture these as you're going because later you'll be able to go back and create some mini metrics out of this exercise that you'll be able to use when you're putting together your final report. When you're doing these interviews, really try to use the knowledge that you have about your organization that, that Jeff brought up a little bit earlier to understand what people's pain points are, speak their language, use their vocabulary, be able to you know, dive deep and really try to elicit um, people's satisfactions and frustrations about what's going on. You know, an area that I've seen this working really well is in, in customer content, you know, all, all over, not just customer case studies, but in, in the content that's being used um, to nurture the, the, the whole pipeline, um, the whole buyer's journey, you know, you may find in talking to people that they're really frustrated because they're not finding enough things in the education phase or they may you know, find things that uh, they may come back and tell you know, everything that we have for conversion um, is only aimed at one persona you know, and when we need something else. So the more that you can speak the language with people, the better these interviews will be for you. Um, really, as Jeff said, listen to their pain points, affirm them, try not to be defensive, even if it's something that you're directly responsible for. So if they tell you that they've created you know, uh, a private Slack channel because the community that you run isn't working for them. Don't tell them how much you spend on the platform. Don't tell them how much time that you're in there. Don't tell them that you're down a head count. Find out what's working in Slack and why, you know, maybe you can replicate that in community. What can you do? Say, or maybe you might find out that Slack is better investment for you guys and maybe you don't need the platform. So try not to be defensive, even though it can be really hard when we've invested so much of our time and energy and budget and things. This is a really good you know, space for you to, to gain trust and make new, make new allies, especially at the senior level. Once you're all done with this, you wanna transcribe these, code them, score them, and really try to produce as much quantitative um, uh, data as you can from them and some great qualitative analysis on top of it. You wanna be able to go back to every single stakeholder um, and provide them with some of your learnings. I think that's really important, especially um, for forging these relationships and keeping them going moving forward. And at that point, you're gonna roll everything up into a, a report and an action plan that you'll ideally deliver to your CMO. And I think it's important to um, know that your CMO probably didn't ask you for this, but they'll be really happy to get it. Um, it'll be something that could be very useful to them afterwards. I like to use a SWOT analysis to do this um, when I'm formulating my report, um, different formats work for different people, but um, this is tried and true. And I think this, this would be a good one to chat through um, if we maybe wanna get some input from people. Some of the things that I think are really important is to lead with your strengths, as I said earlier, to find out what areas of the organization are already leveraging CLG best practices. You're bound to have uncovered some of them during your, um, your interviews. So call out who's already combining efforts, who's maximizing ROI, who's saving on budget um, by working together, who's data-driven. It's so, so important. The more that you can use data to bolster your case, um, the more likely that you'll be to get the executive support that you need. Who's making the most of what they already have? That's super important. Um, you may also uncover you know, shelfware. You may unco uncover some people um, who maybe are you know, in the wrong job that could be shifted over to do something else. So that's important. And you know who's collaborating already? So um, I, I think that if we can kind of shift the paradigm a little bit to say, even if it's not happening inside customer marketing or wherever we may sit, um, what's already working and how can we lead with that? 
you know, conversely, the weaknesses that we all see, you know, where efforts are being duplicated, who's fighting over owning customers, who's self-sourcing, you know, with outside agencies or are doing it themselves or uh, whatever it may be because they're not getting their needs met internally. Who, as I said uh, a minute ago, who's in the wrong job who might be used better elsewhere. Where are customers not being centered? You know, where are we forcing customers to be the touch point for a lot of different departments in our company because we're not talking to each other? And what kind of customer-led gaps aren't on the radar but we see some opportunity for? Um, opportunities that I see common to most companies are an opportunity to have a, a mindset shift in the C-suite towards customer-led growth, growth. Uh, executive sponsorship where you may not have it yet some quick wins that you'll be able to identify and deliver back to people to gain momentum quickly. Elevating the visibility of yourself and, and your team is important, um, especially now that you've gotten to start to forge some of these relationships with senior level people, you wanna keep them going. That will ultimately enable you to focus, to shift your focus from taxes, tactics to strategy. Why it's, while it's not gonna mean that, you know, all of a sudden tomorrow, you're not responsible for filling reference requests anymore. But what it will do is if you are kind of looking at all the resources inside the entire organization, is better distribute those resources to allow you to have the mind space to focus more on strategy um, uh, and trust that you have now kind of allocated the resources correctly to make sure the day-to-day -day tactical stuff is getting done. This should help to protect your existing budget and headcount, hopefully, and because you are leveraging your relationships to do more with less. So Elizabeth, can, can I ask you a question here? Please. So, so I know I'm a recovering forester analyst, right? I've done a lot of this type research and got hired by people, and, and it's very tempting and it's very common for for people to just say, "Well, I, I work in this organization every day. I know what people need. I don't really need to talk to them, right? I know what they ask for. I know I know the business." So, mm -hmm. to kind of counteract that temptation. Uh, are there any examples of big surprises that you've gotten when you've done this with a company where it just totally was a, the response you got was totally different than the assumptions or the hypotheses that you might have had going into the process? That's does a that great make question. sense? Yeah. yeah, it does. It does. And um, I'll I'll kind of preface that by saying um Obviously, I, I try not to have a hypothesis about these things because every company is different and you never know. Right. But um, I can I can think of a company um, that thought that they were delivering um, a customer journey uh, content. Um, so, you know, everything that they were using in their funnel for customer acquisition, ABM retention, they thought that they were delivering um, really cutting edge stuff. Um, and during this, I say cutting edge stuff, that was, you know, fulfilling every need that they had across the company. And during the journey found out um, that in fact, they that they weren't, um, that they were only delivering things that, that worked for the very beginning of the buyer's journey. And the reason that was happening is that two or three CMOs ago, a decision was made to only measure MQLs in this company. And so what was happening is that people were resting on their analyst report laurels um, and creating derivative content that um, that CTA'd back to analyst reports and not delivering anything else um, that they needed to bring people along the rest of the journey. And that was a revelation. That was a big revelation. And in that case, did that cause them, no, but that was not only insights for customer marketing to now work with, but did that at all influence what they were, what was guiding their uh efforts you know to not be yeah, well, only focused I mean, that, on it yeah. yeah that that actually that was a revelation to more than one area of the company I would um, imagine. And they were, yeah. yeah and they were promptly not only measured on mqls anymore that changed in a heartbeat okay so yeah. so so the impact of this is not just customer marketing gets their knowledge and they go off and run with it, right? That this can also be beneficial to the people who, who you're gathering this information from, because sometimes it just makes that person think like, why am I doing this? You know, there's the classic case where, you know, sales will never stop asking for more case studies, like, you know, the challenge solution result written case mm -hmm. study, but that doesn't mean buyers want them. 
And exactly. so, and so, you know, I've worked with companies that where it's like, yeah, sales just wants 10 more of these this month. And, and, but then, uh, but then I remember, well, then we would interview sales and say, okay, what do you do with these? Oh, um, mm-hmm. I just send them whenever I'm selling to somebody in banking, I just send them a banking case study. And I said, well, do you know if this case study is relevant or not? So I, I don't really care. It's just, uh, mm-hmm. it just shows us, shows them that we have another customer in banking. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, well, do you know if the prospect ever reads them? Uh, mm-hmm. I, no, I've never gotten any feedback that they actually read them. And so, so the, that and that person said, well, you know what? Maybe, maybe this isn't the best thing. Maybe we should find mm-hmm. out whether buyers really want. <laughs> yeah, right? absolutely. So, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you called yourself a, a recovering analyst a couple of slides ago. But, yep. you know, in this case, this particular company that I'm thinking of actually rethought their um, commitment to their analyst subscription. They changed it. They didn't get rid of it, but they changed the way that they were working with analysts because they 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 realized that they were spending way too much money on certain things and not enough on others. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I think that, you know, you said, um, could this have the kind of knock-on effect of helping people in other areas to have realizations? I, I would go so far as to say, I hope it's not a knock-on effect. I hope that's how we're approaching it. I would expect that through this discovery um, that every single person that you talk to would learn things, um, not just about customer marketing, but about different parts of the organization. Because you're starting to connect dots um, that don't, don't happen unless someone makes a concerted effort to do this kind of uh, interviewing. Right. Excellent. And so, you know, I think that these last two ones, especially, you know, threats, these are things that obviously they're different in every company. These are some of the most common ones that I see. Um, And and I'd like to highlight the unmeasured or unmet KPIs ones. You know, we all keep coming back to analysts. I'm sorry, to analytics. But, um, you know, I think especially in customer marketing, a lot of us kind of get stuck on the on the proving our worth ones, you know, the, the 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 impact on revenue ones. But there's a lot of other ones as well. Um, Kevin talked a lot about those the other day. I don't want to spend a lot of time on those. Um, it's kind of a whole conversation in itself. But if you even start to piggyback on the KPIs from the other stakeholders that you're talking to, find common ground and create kind of a a, a, a common overarching set of KPIs where customer-led growth all feeds into each other. And I know that, Jeff, you talk about this a lot. Um, you're going to go uh, a lot farther in, in making your case to a, for a customer marketing charter to your, to your CMO. Yep. So speaking of our CMO, um, delivering a formal report. And the reason I say that they'll never see you coming is I've yet to see this be a uh, something that a CMO has tasked a customer marketing department with, um, you know, to go out, listen around the company, uh, look for the connective tissue, figure out how we can put together a customer-led growth strategy. Um, if someone out there is doing it, I would love to meet them because they're fantastic. So I think this is something that frequently needs to bubble up to the CMO. And once they see it, um, they're going to love you. It's going to be really, really hard to say, I'm going to look at a, at a workforce reduction in my customer marketing uh, person or department or team um, once they've brought them something like this, because you are demonstrating your worth. You have shown them that you have connected all the dots. You've had the conversations. You have qualitative and quantitative analysis to show them, um, and you have an action plan. So here we are, um, I've looked at what's working, what's not. I've got all the numbers to back this up. I've got the relationships behind me. This is what I think we should do next. And um, you know, we're all familiar with challenges, solutions, and benefits. So why not present it like that? You make it very direct for your CMO. And um, I really recommend you know, trying to do this uh, in a quarter, if you can. What can you do in 30, 60, and 90 days to try to make some changes? Then say, these are my long-term suggestions, what I'd like to do for a fiscal year. Because at that point, you know, uh, you've protected yourself from any layoffs that might be coming up this quarter. um, And you've protected your budget for the next quarter. I'm sorry, for the next fiscal year. So I think it's really important to be extremely specific um, and talk about, again, all of the synergies, um, all of the alignment that you can get across the organization and why this is going to be a win-win for everybody. 
I think something that I heard on yesterday's call that's really important, um, I think it might have been Rebecca, um, I'm sorry if I got her name wrong, who talked about saying that she wasn't going to do anything this year that didn't align with a high visibility initiative. I think that's really, really important. You know, if your company is, um, you know, coming out with a new product launch, if they are, you know, focusing on retention, if they are, you um, you know, expanding into a new geo, if there's an acquisition, whatever it is, you know, and it, I've worked with a company recently where it was all about the channel and, you know, they were going to quadruple a revenue from the channel in the next fiscal year, whatever it is, make sure you are aligning with that. You need to show how you're supporting that. And I'm not, I don't mean gratuitously, the strategy that you come up with really does need to, to support that. I think it's super important. Jeff, you're making a noise like you um, might have something to say about that. Oh, no, sorry. I was just scratching my eye, but actually I do have something to say, which is, um, you, you know, I'm thinking I, I, I do want to make sure there's plenty of time for people to ask yes. questions or to yes. uh, raise. So I've gone so, over. But but the, you know, one thing that, that came to mind as you were talking about the being proactive here, be, because people aren't going to come to you. They're not going to volunteer their information or they're not going to your, your chain of command is not going to ask you to go seek this information in most mm -hmm. cases unless they really are a data-driven type person and, and they're, they're not as common. And, and so what I found when I was doing this, even at Forrester, when I was building my K business case for a brand new program there is, <laughs> and I was going to the different stakeholders, I, um, the, the first thing they would ask me before they would even reveal anything is, well, what are you going to do with this information, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, because, mm -hmm. well, you know, why, because first of all, it's helping them with the context of what I'm really looking for, but, um, but then, you know, they want to know, if it, is it worth their time really getting into details here? Or is this just another marketing person knocking on their door, uh, looking desperately, trying to figure out how they can increase their value to marketing? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. let's face it, there's a lot of, lot of marketers operate that way. And, and so I would always say, I would, I, was, I would say to them, look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take everything you tell me and I'm going to be formulating some customer-led growth strategies although I wasn't using CLG at the time, but mm -hmm. uh, that's, in hindsight, that's what they were. I'm going to formulate some strategies for mobilizing our customers to, to help you with these initiatives, and then I'm going to come back to you with those. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. But of course, yeah. then, you have, then you have to close the loop, right? You have to come back yeah. to them. Mm -hmm. And what I did like to do is go back, not only go to the CMO, but go back to the people who I interviewed and say, here's what you said, and then here's what you're doing. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's part of your methodology as well as closing the loop with those stakeholders. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm going the wrong direction. I was trying to to go back. Um, yeah, that was on one. That was one of the slides here when I said um, I'm closing the loop when we're talking here. Yep. Oh right. Yeah. Yep. That's right. Yeah. You go back. Yeah. You have to go back to people. It's super super important. Um, I realize that we've gone a little bit over, and so I'm going to kind of touch on one really quick thing here um, and then skip the rest. I think it's really important um, to recognize what we know and also what we don't know. And not all of us have come up through the marketing ranks. So, you know, we not we might not be, you know, campaign experts, we might not be digital demand experts, you know, we not might not know a lot about MDF programs. I think it's really important to recognize where we might have gaps and and learn, keep learning, because that will really help us to cement these relationships, to be invited onto calls, to be invited to participate in new programs and new initiatives around your company, if people feel like you get what they're doing. Um, and so that doesn't mean that we all have to go back to school, but it does mean that we can read up. There's so much available to us out there online. You know, you can take an hour a week to do something. You can ask peers, you know, if you can sit in on things. I mentioned the content board, you know, but if your company has one, those are fantastic places to listen and learn. Um, you know, whatever you can do to, to kind of increase your knowledge about what your colleagues and peers are doing, I think will really help you um, in, in these areas. So I'm gonna skip some of these other ones. Um, just to talk, sorry, right here. I'm sorry, I'm just... I wanted to talk about here, which is um, if anybody in the community wants to take some time to chat this through because they feel like this is something they might be able to implement or they feel that there's budget cuts looming in their company and they're a little afraid, I'm really happy to take an hour to talk with anybody um, about your specific company um, and strategize how you might put some of this into action um, if you think it would be helpful and, and you can find me on Slack.
Um, so hopefully that's lots a little bit of time for some, <laughs> some questions. <laughs> well, well, let's see. I mean, that, that was cer certainly, I mean, fascinating to me. Uh, you know, but my, my really opened my eyes, Elizabeth, what you said about how this doesn't just benefit you. Because I was kind of thinking when we were talking the other day that the, that the end result is just, uh, you know, we get what we need to go do our job better. But, uh, but, but seeing that this type of process can also give other people what they need. But it shouldn't have been a surprise for me because even when I do strategy workshops with, with my clients, uh, the, the people that join those who are there as contributors, sometimes, uh, you know, when you have a couple people in the same room, sometimes like they've never brought this issue up before. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, they've mm -hmm. just been living with it. And mm -hmm. the, by by you now going to them, asking these questions, it's the first time they've aired it to somebody. Mm -hmm. And and so now, uh, you know, it's amazing how many people just harbor their doubts or disappointments or gaps and, and just go about what the best they can living with it. Yeah, so, that's so true, so. Jeff. And I also think oftentimes they don't realize that in their organization to have the same disappointments and, and gaps and problems and and they've you know that maybe somebody else might have a solution for it that exists already or maybe if enough people have these same problems someone would be willing to put some resource behind solving them yeah so so curious anybody who's listening have um have you um I, i'm sure everybody has tried with with different levels of success and results to to do this either in a formal or informal way, but does anybody want to share any experiences they've had as it relates to really identifying those stakeholders and trying to understand their needs and goals? Anybody have any thoughts on that? This is Maria Sturgeon. I have a just a comment. This was very, very valuable. Thank you very much. Love this information. So what would you suggest um, I, you know, I did a lot of this work in a recent position. I was actually just laid off last week. Oh, I'm sorry. I suggest as, um, you know, unfortunately my CMO was several layers up and above me there was kind of roadblocks and challenges in terms of people being intimidated by this information I was sharing. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I talked to Jeff about this customer uh, XCon uh, just a little bit and some of the challenges I was facing in a new role. How would you suggest kind of addressing uh, that, those obstacles? Yeah. That, that's a great question. And I think, you know, the, the easy answer is that it's different in every company, obviously. And I think I would ask you kind of how you went about sharing it. Were you kind of feeding back to, pe to the larger group, you know, everything that everybody was saying? Um, I, I found something that's been helpful that I've done a few times is before I've shared back to all the people I interviewed, I actually put together an ebook um, and shared it directly with the CMO unsolicited um, and said, uh, this is, you know, pieces of this, I'm going to start feeding back to, you know, your direct reports. I wanted you to have it first. Um, and, you know, as an outside consultant, this is easier. I'll be the first to admit that. Right. Um, but, you know, even internally, I think sometimes you can find an ally, you know, I, I, I've, I've had weird allies, like the director of the project management office, you know, who has everybody's ears or, you know, find the person you that, that's beloved, you know, that can help you get this out to a, a, a wide group of people that, that need to hear it. But yeah. my best advice is to start from the top down, um, because if if the CMO sees it and says, oh, my goodness, I had no idea about some of this stuff. Um, if it's compelling enough, that person will get on the phone to their direct reports and say, have you seen this? Yeah, and that's, I think that was part of my challenge, though. I knew the CMO. He actually came after I did, and I knew him from a previous company. My managers were very intimidated by that. So, and the, and the CMO or the, the people in between? The CMO, well, the people. The CMO. <laughs> I know this is all, like, everybody keeps this here. Like, the people I reported to were very intimidated because I knew the CMO very well. So. Mm -hmm caught up in kind of a yeah I, that's it, it, I mean yeah that's a relationship challenge yeah that, I think more than an information challenge yeah. so I keep thinking over and over in my head replaying things how could I have done this differently and, and the bottom line maybe that you know maybe the company just wasn't a good fit and um you know I'm grateful for new opportunities um yeah. you know it, that session was it, 
Okay. Maria, Maria, I was just, I just wanted to ask Maria the was was the intimidation was because of the setting, because of the relationship, not because of the or 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 was it because of the findings themselves? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. I think it was with the relationship number one that I felt like I could go directly to that CMO. Yeah. Um, he was coming directly to me, asking me for things for insights, but also like some of the I think the findings I presented, they didn't want to believe. Mm. They, yeah. Were they kind of were they, were they threatened by them because was it kind of showcasing some gaps in yeah, their area? So. Yeah. I so. so I think it was maybe showcasing some of their weaknesses. Um, yep. And I, my intent was not to do that at all. My intent was to bring, you know, like I, you hired me, you came after me for my expertise. I'm doing what I can, but I think in the long term, it, it kind of it burned me, and I just. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just, you know, like looking back on this, I'm like, I just can't understand this all. And I've got people from the company contacting me, telling me what value, how value I added in the short time I was there. And mm -hmm. that's good to hear, but that doesn't help uh, pay my bills or my health insurance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you, Maria, what, what do you think with, with this layoff? Um, do you think that kind of those people in between you and the CMO had something, you know, had something to do with why you were um, mm -hmm. on the list? Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely, I absolutely, like, hundred percent think that. Yeah. Uh, it's that if that's the case, then that's not the right company for me anyway. Right. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. If, so, if, if I could, yeah, I, I just wanted to add one thing, Maria, because uh, I'm I'm also not only am I a recovering analyst, I'm a recovering CMO, and so I've I've, I've been a CMO at a couple of organizations with two or three levels below me, and I can tell you that the the rock stars in my organization, even if they even if I had two, one or two people between us and them on the org chart, the rock stars in my marketing organization, I always had a lot of direct relationships with, and I would go to them, and I set that expectation with my chain of command. And yeah. so if we're, if we're looking to make ourselves recession proof and layoff proof, you can't worry about sort of ruffling the feathers of the peers, because if you just try to obey the chain of command and have everything follow proper procedure, you're going to be looked at as more expendable. Mm -hmm. and, right. and so, and, and I had to do layoffs. I've had to do layoffs where I've had to pick across my organization. I was told you have to get rid of five heads one time across my whole org. And I didn't, I never laid off the people that I had those direct relationships with or who were proactively coming to me with ideas, but yeah. I would just, but I would also make sure, you know, I would tell them, you know, make sure your boss knows about this, right? Uh, you, you know, and, and, and you're, you know, you're working through this with your boss, right? As, as opposed right. to just being a constant skip level, you know, end around. Yeah. On them. yeah. 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 All right. Kim, I saw your message. I'm shocked to hear that you were like, oh, like, I'm completely shocked to hear that. Yes. Oh, that's and so yeah. am I. And and Kim, I owe you a I owe you a call today, Kim. <laughs> okay, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say, um, you know, I I feel because there's probably a similar situation of some intimidation by some other prior relationships and things mm -hmm. like that. So I just sent you know, that direct message, Maria. But yeah, I think you know the findings, um, making sure that the findings align with the business uh, strategy, but mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard if you are kept in the dark on what some mm -hmm. of those are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, especially from a CMO perspective, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they always kind of have <laughs> some secret projects or secret mm -hmm. things you know, they yeah. have in mind to go after and do. And, yeah. uh, but, and, you know, they have the power to make change, but mm -hmm not explain that change, I guess, if you will, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. so then that can create gaps or in that information kind of funneling down the path. So I know appreciated yeah. you start at the top, but sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, would, I mean, none, none of this is easy. And I, I'm the first to recognize that um, as an outsider, you know, something that gets brought in and paid to do this kind of work. Um, obviously they, they're, you know they're more inclined to listen to what you have to say if it's if it's not um, yep. if it's not bad news. It's harder to hear bad news is the wrong term, but it, it's harder to hear hard truths from a colleague than it is from an outsider. I, I, I absolutely recognize that. Right. Yeah. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for arranging these, Jeff. I'm going to go back. Unfortunately, I couldn't attend the one yesterday. I'm going to go back and listen to the recording, but these are always fabulous, and I appreciate all the work that you do around 
our space and, and seeing the value. Well, well, thank you for joining, Maria. Thank you for joining, Kim. Everybody else. Oh, thank you. Yeah, good luck, you guys. I hope you land someplace great soon. Yes, and, yeah. and Elizabeth, thank you for, for sharing. And so. Yes, thank uh, you. Yep. Okay, take care, everybody. Okay, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks. Thanks so much. Bye.